As I sing this Tumri in Bhairavi, an evocative haunting melody that is usually sung at the conclusion of a concert, but in the grammar of North Indian classical music is also sung in the early hours of the morning. I do wonder, am I looking at the end of an era or an end which led to the beginning of a new dawn? I think of my privileges of being a performer in 21st century India. I get on to the stage and perform what I have got from my gurus with gratitude. I sing to all kinds of audiences from very diverse backgrounds. But the truth is some of this music comes from a considered social baggage. This including the music of the robust, entertaining courtesans. I even wonder if they had the privilege to enjoy it as much as I can afford to. If pleasure was an agency they felt they had a right to. This is a time long before gramophone was invented. Music was savoured by the nobility in the grandeur of the magnificent dancing halls. The Jalsa Ghars, as they were popularly known. Here, the courtesans trained in singing and dancing arts by the Ustads and performed in the mehfils for their wealthy patrons. Here we are talking about an art form, evolution of art forms of different kinds in music and the vehicles that take these art forms to the audience. Let us say during the time of Bahadur Shah Zafar, for instance, they would have been all court musicians. But eventually, when they started to crumble, uh, they had to find uh, their own kind of places to reside. And one of the most important places to reside were in Kothas. You see? And uh, therefore, that tradition was continued. Mujra was uh, more in the kind of daira of tehzeeb, you know what I mean? It's like paying your respect to the audience, you know what I mean? First, you elevate the audience on a 
kind of uh, you honor the audience that's what mujra means you know it's you just aap matlab ek apni khiraj pesh kar rahi hain samain ke samne and then after that you were dealing with them on a kind of a intellectual level and then slowly slowly you can take them to any level हमने जब अम्मा से पूछा बाबू कहाँ गए हैं तो उन्होंने कहा बेटा मुजरा आया था तो गए हैं वहाँ गोरखपुर गए हैं मुजरा आया था इस जगह गए तो मुजरा शब्द था जो हमें याद है कि राम झरोखे बैठ के सबका मुजरा लें जैसी जाकी चाकरी ताको तैसा दें तो झरोखे में बैठ के राम मुजरा ले रहे हैं यानी अटेंडेंस यानी हाजरी तो मैं मुजरा बजा लाता हूँ यानी कि मैं हाजरी लगा के आता हूँ बड़ा शुद्ध शब्द था बड़ा फारसी उर्दू का शब्द था लेकिन उस जमाने का पुराना शब्द है बाई द टर्न ऑफ द नाइनटीन सेंचुरी थिंग्स बिगैन टू चेंज विद द इन्वेंशन ऑफ द ग्रामोफोन विथ वॉट लेटर केम टू बी नोन एज द रिकॉर्डिंग एक्सपीडिशन ऑफ इंजीनियर्स ऑफ द न्यूली फाउंडेड साउंड कंपनीज The 1900s were witness to the incredible beginnings of musical entertainment. A new platform of performance emerged for professional singers beyond the courts. Known as bijis, their music now found admiring listeners throughout the country. The popularity of the gramophone foresaw how people shall consume music a few decades later. Fred Gaisberg was the principal recording engineer of the Gramophone and Typewriters Limited. He arrived in Kolkata in 1902 to set up a recording studio and soon realized the difficulty of the task that lay ahead. Though a foreigner of means, even Gaisberg knew that with little knowledge of India's diverse music culture, finding talented singers is not going to be easy the gramophone company started spreading its recording endeavors deep into the country from north to south the agents went from one major city to another setting up new studios and recruiting fresh talent for the recordings the people from the gramophone company didn't have very much so they set up an office here and looked for people they got couple of things it was very interesting because the first thing they went to the theaters the theaters were places where music was being produced commercially as it were people went bought tickets listened to music or listened to theater saw theater whatever so um, they went there and they got two theater artists the first day to record that was the first recording made and actually the first recording made was of an englishman uh, kakat resident who recorded for them the second lot was the these women who recorded and a few days later they got hold of gaurjan and they never looked back as, as you might say because gaurjan remained a main uh, stay of their recording endeavor the first commercial recording took place in kolkata in the year 1902 The singer was Gohar Jahan, a baiji widely acclaimed for her singing, no less than a diva.
hailed as Kolkata's first dancing star by the gramophone company, Gohar Jaan earned fame and fortune far beyond the reach of any other artist of her day through her recordings. Already thrilled at having discovered the country's thriving Kota culture, Gaysberg's awe and admiration knew no bounds when he met Gohar Jaan. He writes of her in his memoirs. An Armenian Jewess, hers were among the 600 records which proved a firm foundation for our new enterprise. Every time she came to record, she amazed us by appearing in a new gown, each one more elaborate than the last. Gohar Jaan was very good. He was very good. He was very good. He was very good. और कदरदान का ना कहिए बता एक उस वाह वाह ये मालूम है एक शेर पढ़ दिया अब एक भाव दिखा दिया उसकी तारीफ हो रही दस पंद्रह मिनट वाह क्या नजर उठी क्या नजर गई कैसे देखा कैसे आपने गर्दन मोड़ी कैसे आप कहाँ जाते हो यार मुझसे नैना मिलाए इतनी सी बातें मैंने कहाँ जाते हो यार मुझसे नैना मिलाए तो इतनी सी बात आह क्या बात है गोहर्स लाइफ अब फ्रॉम हर मदर्स टाइम uh, gives you the entire, because she is the transitional figure, because she is the bridge between the past of the uh, Kotas of Lucknow and uh, UP and Delhi, and then the future, uh, so which became, you know, singers singing professionally and making records and doing all sorts of things, and finally in the cinema. I think she was, she is a very interesting transitional figure, uh, Gohar. And uh, that part, and, it, and what really was the catalyst for that change was the gramophone. Because without the gramophone, none of these things would have actually happened. One might wonder what really goes into the making of a performer, of a star of a diva the audience just loves and absolutely adores. There are two constants in the world of music, taaleem or training and riyaz or practice. These really set the standards for performance. Stories and anecdotes abound just on what it takes an artist to get to that level of perfection. Months of training and years of rigor. In the world of Baijis, these two parameters became even more complex. How did knowledge come to them? In our celebrated oral tradition, this knowledge came to them differently. Perhaps not in the same manner in which their ustad trained their male students. The taaleem or training of the Baijis proceeded on different assumptions. Exchange of knowledge was thought of also as a monetary exchange. There is little evidence that they were taught traditional bandishas or compositions. There was also little enthusiasm in classifying them as gharane dar singers or torchbearers of tradition. I find that the male ustads seem to have been extremely, extremely negligent and extremely uh, careless and perhaps miserly in training women ustads. But the interesting point is that women paid the male ustads. Uh, Kenyar informs us that um, Janki Bai paid Hassu Khan 2,000 rupees a month it must in the 1880s, which must have been something like two lakhs, how, how, who knows, even more. And what did she train, train her? Because Janki Bai recorded, of all the recordings that we have, some 200 recordings perhaps she made. There is one, there, is, there are actually two khayals, which I've been able to identify for my, in, in our recording. And, and both are mis mislabeled and the bandish is not properly taught. And of an artist of Janki Bai's caliber to pick up 
something would have been nothing at all. But it seems to me that there must have been some kind of intentional, uh, as it were, uh, misinformation from the male sides. But again, I'm saying that it's the women artists that in many ways were financing, bankrolling the, the male, male ustads. A very large number of women artists were recording. The venturing into commercial recording was indeed a proof of the enterprising nature and talent of the Baijis. But it was also the result of the peculiar social customs of the time and prejudices about this new technology. Many great musicians refused to record, some as a matter of prestige, and some others owing to their reservations about the new technology. Even some of the women singers, like Kesar Bai Kerkar, the doyen of Jaipur Gharana, and Babli Bai Salgaonkar, the illustrious court singer of Bhavnagar, recorded very little because they found it beneath their artistic aspirations. The singers of that time, strangely enough, did not want to sing because they, they felt that their, the power that they had would disappear, would be taken away by some machine. You know, they'd lose their talent by singing into a megaphone. These reservations, however, disappeared over the following years as the recordings found popularity in major cities. The reason why Kolkata and Bombay were important centers for the wives is because th these were places where there were lots of people and there, was, there were potentially large audiences. Because you will find that unlike male ustads, who are identified by gharana. Women ustads are identified by places of residence. Most of these places you will see are uh, what we used to call in Bangla, ganjo, places of trade. And it is there that they had their uh, kothas. And they identified themselves on the recording companies by saying that Amir Jan of Panipat, uh, such and such of uh, Mirat, such and such of so that is, seems to me to be a reasonable idea. As Gaysberg recalls, women singers were certainly a better choice than their male counterparts. Performing in major cities across the country, their mastery of classical genres was non pareil But it was through them that the semi-classical genres like Tumri scaled new heights of popularity and found mainstream acceptance. very large body of music that would include forms like the Thumri, the Dadra, the Kajri, the Chaiti and the numerous forms that are related to these. Many of the names of these forms we no longer use or no longer familiar with, but they were forms, some were seasonal, some were related to social rites and rituals. And women were the custodians of these forms. Thumri ko chote chote kai raago mein dal diya jata hai. Jaise shaam ka khamaat ga rahe hain, to usme mein bhair bhi bhi laga di. Mein usme paraj bhi laga sakti hoon, mein usme bhairo bhi laga sakti hoon. To kai raago ka mishran ho jata hai. Is liye mishra ho gaya, mishrit ho gaya. To wo jab bhaunaya, jab badalti hai, 
कोई आशा डूबी जाए तो डूबी जाए डूबी जाए नीचे ही डूबेगा ऊपर डूबना नहीं होता नीचे डूबता है आदमी तो उसमें डूबी जाए जाए या भोर हो तो पिया मोरे आए ये ठुमरी के अंतरे में तो हमें तो सवेरा बताना ही पड़ेगा भोर कैसे हुआ तो इसलिए मिश्रित हो गया तो मिश्रित हो गया तो थोड़ा ख्याल तो शास्त्री में चला गया लेकिन ठुमरी को उप शास्त्री इसलिए बोले कि मिश्र रागों का इसमें मिश्रण कर दिया In 1908, the first manufacturing plant was set up in Sialda, near Kolkata. The Indians working there called it the Baja Khana. Sometimes the machine was even referred to as Chudi Ka Baja, meaning the bangle machine. By that time the gramophone recordings had become hugely popular among the Indian masses. There was an increasing interest in the records. They sold a great deal. People were very interested in buying them, taking them home, listening to them. They could be carried from one village to the next. It was almost like a ritual that perhaps one day a week it was played and everybody gathered around to listen to it. The involvement of the Baijis in gramophone recording marked the beginning of a new era of music consumption in India. Years after Gohajan's first commercial recording in 1902, names like Janki Bai Chappan Chori, Chunni Bai, Shamshad Begum, Asghari Jan, Miss Funny Bala, Miss Godavari, Jadu Mani Dasi, Miss Mumtaz Jan. Kali Tara and several others rang out in the industry corridors and among the music lovers of the country. As a singer myself I am struck by their versatility. The many languages they recorded in, the large repertoire of genres like Dhrupad, Dhamar, Sadra, Khayal, Chaturang, Tarana, bhav geet lakshan geet and tumri all that they had mastered despite several odds by 1910 the gramophone industry was formidable 
A staggering 2,000 regional songs had been recorded in languages including Bengali, Hindi, Gujarati, Urdu, and Marathi stage songs as well. In no time, these women singers, whose voices helped preserve the nuances of singing, became a household name. The three-minute recording rule brought unforeseen changes to production. Baijis had to adapt in terms of pitch and speed to adapt to the technology, which at that point of time was rather crude. In this regard, Zohra Bai Agrewali really took on technology perhaps like no other Bai did. In North Indian classical music, khayal is the most evolved form. An elaborate genre with complex elements, she adapted it beautifully into the three-minute format of the 78s. Saringi artists were, were trainers. And you have the name of Siyaji Maharaj, for instance, in, in Banaras, who trained a whole host, generations of women artists. And I don't know for what reason, perhaps he was a trusted each. And the other thing which you might find interesting about Sarangi uh, players, of course, Sarangi players are um, I, I, I mean, the Ustads try to reserve their material for their gharana, for their students, for their disciples, for their Gandaban shagids and family and whatever, whatever. But it is the Sarangi Ustad who is in some sense that uh, play, the person who, who might pick up the bandish and carry it somewhere else. So it becomes a kind of mo much more... Uh, kind of mobility of knowledge through the uh, Sarangi Ustad, which I find interesting. Iqbal Bana was from Delhi. Anwari Bai was from Delhi. Anwari Bai was very popular in Delhi. Bibo Bai was from Jaipur. Rasulan Bai was from Banaras. Siddharshvi Bai was from Banaras. It was very popular. Girja Ji was all popular. Now, let's see. Which thing is coming? Shamshad Bhai was very good and very happy. Who was the mother of Sayra's daughter? And Naseem Ki Maa, Shamshad Bhai, Shamiya. They were classical singers, Allah Dhe Khan Sahib Ki Shagir. They were very good singers. And when they came, they were very good singers. 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 So, I played with them with them too. The year 1931 marked the beginning of sound films in India. And interestingly, some of the songs actually recorded for the gramophone became popular and then found their way into films. Few people, for instance, know that Mohe Pan Ghatpe, the delightful Dadra that became famous after the magnum opus Mughalayazam, was originally sung by Indu Bala, who in turn was a contemporary of the likes of Kamla Jharia, the famous ghazal queen of the 40s. Gifted singers, talented performers and engaging entertainers, many turned into legends by sheer virtue of their work.
Popularized through their recordings, many of these singers also began a simultaneous career working for the prominent theater companies of that time. Famous Nojrul singer Angur Bala began her career with a stage performance for Cornwallis Theatre in Kolkata. She performed in numerous stage plays and when the talkies arrived in 30s, she, along with many other Baijis, found her way into the magical world of cinema. Jaddan Bai, the mother of the famous actress Nargis, was noticed by the legendary K.L. Segal who brought her into cinema. From a successful gramophone singer, Jaddan went on to become an actress, a music director, a producer, and even founded the Sangeet Movie Tone. People who are in the entertainment business uh, in India have never been given any kind of uh, normal reputation. You know, they've always been considered as somehow a little less lower people, you know, who, who can be hired, you know. If you think of somebody like Shanta Apte, uh, nobody thought of Shanta Apte in her time uh, that she was somebody who you would have uh, you would be absolutely um, seventh heaven because she came to visit you. You wouldn't feel like that. You would, in fact, try and not tell anybody. The situation has changed, A, because, you know, the, the evaluation, their value, the, the kind of value that you place on them, even monetary value, that has changed. Because, you see, because they, uh, the technology has also helped. Cinema and television have made them all household figures. This didn't happen at that time. Right at the beginning, during... Dada Sahib Halke's time, uh, nobody, no woman wanted to act in films. So he had to make do with uh, men doing women's role. So that was a different time. But uh, after that also, the films were not considered a very good profession. It was frowned upon. And uh, we were the first generation of working women. And then working per se, working was bad enough. You know, and working in films was very, very bad. Durga Kote was the very first person who came from what one might call a regular, uh, educated, middle class background. And uh, she made news for doing that. And she shocked her peers by becoming an actress. But she led the way. Because if it wasn't for her, um, it wouldn't have happened so easily as it did eventually. Because, you know, she, she, on her own terms, she came and then nobody ever pointed fingers at her. And after her, nobody has pointed fingers at any artist.
With sound coming into films, the recording industry went through a massive change. Most of the recorded repertoire was now supposed to consist of film songs. It is important to mention here Saraswati Devi or Khurshid Homji, who was said to be the first female music composer in the industry. Beginning her career with Himanshu Rai's Jawani Ki Hawa, she later became a pioneer of the playback technique with films like Achhut Kanya, where she lent her voice to Devika Rani, one of the celebrated actors of the black and white era. This concept of uh, the song being part of your performance, that you are being the character and acting, I think it's, uh, it's uh, you have to get into that, that mode of it. It's a different genre, it's a different concept, you know. It's not re realistic as such, you know, you don't break into a song when you're talking to somebody, but you just have to accept it. It's a, again, a part of storytelling. You know, it's part of Hindi films. That's how Hindi films are made. Many popular names of that time include Miss Indu Bala, Shamshad Begum, Amir Bai Karnataki, Zohra Bai Ambale Wali, and this list can go on and on with names of these singers who breathed life into playback singing in the early years of Indian cinema. Some even turned into successful producers, like the Bengali singer Kanan Bala, who, beginning with a small role for Madan Theatres and after working for numerous films with Radha Films and New Theatres, set up her own banner called Srimati Films. Cinema, by now, was a lucrative option. Women were much more adept at negotiating early technology, recording, including film. And that is why I think that the continuity from gramophone records to film is a, actually a continuous and unbroken thing because they are negotiating these new spaces fearlessly almost. They are facing the challenges of these new technologies and facing them and coming to what you might say rational and, and uh, practical, pragmatic answers to it, that's all. However, let's also remember that this was the time when the independence movement was at a feverish pace and needless to say, several of the Baijis became a part of it. Financial contributions to political parties, singing and writing songs of freedom, wearing and spinning khadi in the spirit of Swadeshi, much was also being done by the Baijis for the nationalist movement and the ongoing social reforms. H. 
hailing from a community of Goan temple singers called the Kalavans. Anjani Bai Malpekar worked fervently to improve their social standing. Kanan Bala founded the Mahila Shilpi Mahal to help the Bengali female artists, and Jaddan Bai supported the Progressive Writers Association. Committed to the national cause, Siddheshwari Devi, the queen of Tumri who hailed from Varanasi, was known to end all her musical soirees singing Vande Mataram. It's rather ironic that it is this very nationalist movement that combines with the loss of royal patronage, leading to the decline of this culture. Many chose a different line of work, some even a different life altogether. A community endowed with charm, charisma and talent, but criticism and antipathy shadowed this legacy. Mired in curiosity and controversy, will we really ever get to know the lives of the Indian women on record? Several stories about their interesting liaison with patrons do make for lively anecdotal banter. Perhaps also a very important aspect of Indian music. But I do wonder how this perception a sort of public pressure, this constant need to prove, not just musically, but even socially, affected their creative approach to life. Actually, the Tawaif really brought a lot of intellect to art, which was there in Awadh. But I think what had happened was after 1857, that whole institution began to get uh, degraded. It, you know, Victorian values set in. And uh, I think the kind of patronage they used to get to become artists, that was lost. And the reason to become artists was lost. Till uh, maybe the era of uh, the gramophone and the revival of uh, going into a broader market, you know what I mean? So when I was in Lucknow, I mean obviously I, in my early childhood, I, I met Begum Akhtar also in the house and there were a lot of other singers of that kind. And uh, I had a huge collection of records and we used to listen to all these women and it worked on my mind. And that period of Abad was also going through a kind of a depression, you know, and this was in the 50s, mid 50s, after the abolition of the Zimidari, the, 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 that was the last nail in the coffin as far as this culture is concerned. Indian music as we practice it today has stayed with us for centuries. It's evolved and adapted 
It has even seen the rise and fall of kingdoms. But with its sheer resilience, it continues to exist, even thrive in 21st century India. We celebrate it, we question it. Whatever the challenges, we reinvent it, but it stays with us. The music of the Baijis came out of the salon and entered the studio, making history, creating forays even in other worlds, literally, with Kesar Bai's voice soaring in space in the year 1977. History might have tussled with these women, pushed them to the margins, forgotten about most of them, taken them off the record. But the fact is that here we are, in the 21st century India, still reminiscing, enjoying, and wallowing in a hundred-year-old history. One can only feel inspired. Rest the key,